Hey everyone, it's Brian. In this video, I'd like to help you solve this problem, which is actually a partial fractions decomposition problem, and then an integration. So you can see from looking at this problem that it doesn't exactly have the form of anything you're used to up to this point. Like it's not one of those inverse trig, it's not a u substitution, that won't work. So we're sort of just left with a partial fraction decomposition. And the first thing you want to do, if you can, is factor the denominator. And so how did I come up with that so quickly? Well, you can realize that this is actually a difference of squares. If you remember back to algebra, the difference of squares formula facts, factors just like this. Now what am I going to do? These are both simple linear factors in the denominator, meaning the partial fraction decomposition will be very easy for us. And it sets up like this. So this is what we have in our integrand, especially if I write, write it like this, maybe it'll be even more clear. And what I want to do is I want to break this fraction up. I want to decompose this fraction into two different fractions. And my claim is that this fraction here should break apart into two different fractions, having the first denominator as the first fraction and the second denominator in the second fraction, right? There should be some way to do this such that if I combine these fractions, I'd get what I started with. Now, I don't know exactly what it is. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So on top, I'm just gonna call this A. I don't know what it is. And on the other one, I'll call this B. I'm not sure what it is. And the reason it's just A and B, maybe you've seen a more complicated example. Since these are both linear factors in the denominator, I have just constants in the numerator. And now what I'm gonna do in the next step to solve for A and B, the first thing you do, and some teachers tend to gloss over this and uh, tends to confuse some students, is you multiply both sides by the entire denominator on the left here. So. Uh, I'm going to break it down and show you exactly what that looks like. I'm going to multiply every single term by 1 minus x times 1 plus x. So if I do it right here, if I multiply by 1 minus x times 1 plus x, multiply by 1 minus x times 1 plus x, and the last term, 1 minus x times 1 plus x. Right? Anything I do to one side, I have to do to the, do to the other, to do it to every term. Uh, some nice cancellations happen, because on the left, the 1 minus x is cancel, the 1 plus x is cancel, and I'm just left with 1. Nice. Right here, only the 1 minus x is cancel, and I'm left with a times 1 plus x. Over here, with the b, the 1 plus x is cancel, so I'll be left with b times 1 minus x. And this is a lot easier of an equation to deal with. Now, to find A and B here, there's a couple of things you could do. Um, some people simply substitute the value, and that's totally valid in this instance. The reason I'm not going to do it is because there are certain instances where the substitution uh, will lead you astray. Sometimes uh, if you're multiplying by zero, for example. The way I'm going to solve this particular problem is to do what's called matching coefficients. Let me show you what that looks like. If I distribute everything here. This would be a times 1 plus a times x. And then I'd also have b times 1 minus b times x. And I'm going to group by powers of x's. So if I group the x's together and then factor out an x, or the way I tell my students is how many x's do I have? Well, it looks like I've got a of them. And I've also got minus b of them. And how many constants do I have? Well, a and b are constants. So this is plus a plus b. So all I've really done is a rearrangement and factoring of x. Why am I doing this? Well, this is an equality. So whatever's on the left has to equal whatever's on the right. Meaning, whatever the coefficients are, maybe I'll insert a plus 0x just for some emphasis here, the coefficient of x has to match the coefficient of x on the other side. In other words, I'm matching the coefficients. 
In this case, zero, the coefficient of x on the left, had better equal a minus b, the coefficient of x on the right. And likewise, the constant on the left, one, has to equal the constant on the right, which in this case is a plus b. So what do I have here? I have a system of equations. I have two equations and two unknowns. And you probably learned how to solve something like this pretty early in your algebra career. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a number of ways to do this too, right? Maybe the easiest would just be to add both of these equations. So if I simply rewrite this and I add these equations, well, 0 plus 1 is 1, a plus a is 2a, minus b plus b is no b. So I get two, uh, 1 equals 2a. Well, this would mean the same thing as a is equal to a half. And if I know what a is, well, I can just plug it back in here to get b. That would be 1 equals 1 half plus b, or that b equals a half. 1 minus a half is a half. And you'll see that these two things satisfy both of these equations. So now I'm going to go back to right where I first decomposed these things. If you remember, it was this line. And now that I know what a and b are, I'll just substitute them. Well, now I've completely done my partial fraction decomposition and I'm ready to integrate. So, I mean, all I really have to do uh, is, is integrate, right? Because this is exactly what the inside of this integrand turned into. Or maybe, maybe it makes you feel better and you just want to write the integral sign like that. And all I have to do is, well, integrate. And maybe it's obvious what you're supposed to do and maybe it's not. I mean, I can factor out a half all the way out front. And let's think about this. You could do a u substitution. That's fine. But I recommend you kind of getting in the habit of seeing what these look like and realizing most of them are going to turn into natural logarithm functions. So if I just have a linear factor in the bottom and I'm integrating, it's probably going to be a natural log function. Why is that? Well, if you just look at the first one, if you do a u substitution, let u be 1 minus x, then du would be minus dx, we would just have the integral of minus du over u. And likewise, if I made a second u substitution, I'll call this u1, and uh, u2, I'll let u2 be 1 plus x, then d u2 would be just dx, I'm just going to get du over u. So you should be pretty familiar with these sort of u substitutions. And then um, what's the antiderivative of 1 over u? Well, it's natural log absolute value of u. So this is minus ln absolute value of u. And the same thing here, this would be plus ln absolute value of u. Plus c. But I know what u is in these cases. It's just 1 minus x for the first slot and 1 plus x for the second slot. And hey, there you go. And you've solved the problem. So what I would recommend is just noticing right here that the antiderivative of 1 over 1 minus x is just natural log of 1 minus x. And you have to throw a negative out front because of this negative x here and the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x is natural log of 1 plus x. So I hope this video was helpful. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, please like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And let me know if you have any questions at all. Have a great day.